Hello friends, my name is Chris and today I want to talk to you about a comment that I recently received which is from Kendra and I'm not sure if I pronounced that right but the question in this comment is essentially whether or not I could do a breakdown of the set or the equipment that I am using for the production of these videos and how that has evolved over the last few years. Now, I want to answer this question and I want to do it relatively thoroughly. However, there are a couple of constraints to this question or the answer rather. Now, first up, I am going to start with the time when I switched from Sony to Canon with the Canon EOS R. So that's the first thing that I want to kind of give you as a reference point, because before that I was using the Canon EOS, I think the 30D, then the 5D Mark II. Then I switched all over to Sony cameras with the a7 II as well as the a7S II. And from that, I switched back to Canon with the Canon EOS R. The next thing is that I am going to be talking about video equipment and audio equipment, but I am mainly focusing on this studio situation. And I have been making videos in this type of environment for the last few years. But I also have used drones, 360 cameras, action cameras, as well as uh, gimbal stabilizers and stuff like that. But that is not the topic for today. Today I'm going to talk about this type of talking head video and uh, just the in-studio stuff mostly. Some of those things of course are also used when I'm out and about. I don't think that there is anything that I am talking about where I got it from a sponsor or something like that. There's one more thing before we jump in. This is not necessarily a recommendation as of right now, because what I am talking about here is how my equipment evolved from one point to where it is right now. I myself see certain flaws in the setup that I have as of right now, and I would probably make certain changes if I would put out the drawing board and just purchase completely everything from scratch or sell everything and buy a whole new set. I would probably do certain things differently. But in this video, I want to share the thought process that went into those decisions as I was upgrading from one step to the next. And now with all that said, it is time to jump in with the first thing. And that's actually probably the oldest part of the whole kit. And that is this type of light setup. As of right now, I am still using these lights. Mostly right now, I'm using one to the front of me right there. And if I switch to this camera here, this is the light that is right there. I also have one kind of above my head over there and I am not using the second one. However, these lights that I have here were pretty much purchased, I think sometime around 2010 or something like that. So these are 10 year old lights. I should probably upgrade these to something with LEDs, some light dome from Aperture or something like that. But as of right now, I am actually still using these lights right here and they were dirt cheap for the fact that they have been holding up for about a decade at this point. I think it costs around 125 euros or so. Now from these lights, I also have to mention one more thing that is not related to the video equipment per se, but I actually don't really like when people are not talking about this. And that is the laptop that I'm using. This is the MacBook 2017. It's the 3.1 gigahertz version with 16 gigs of RAM, four gigabytes graphics card and all of that. This is the machine that I am using as of today. However, it is not the machine that I started with. Like I, I think I upgraded it in 2017 pretty much or 2018, something around that time from a 2015 and went to this machine right here. And I would love to upgrade this again, probably once the M1X or whatever Apple is going to do with the naming of that chipset comes out. And of course, if the finances also allow for this upgrade. Now this marks one of the centerpieces and not a very cheap centerpiece at that. However, you do need a computer and a powerful one to be able to do video editing. Now, of course, it is really good that Apple now has the M1 lineup with the new chipset that is relatively inexpensive and you can get away with a MacBook 13 inch with the M1 chip or even the Mac mini if you already have keyboard, mouse and display. And those are great options. But for me, I have to have a travelable device that I can carry around with me. And also I am a person that likes to change it up depending on where I want to work. 
For example, for those times where I want to walk and work at the same time, I want to switch to that desk. Then I also want to be able to switch to this desk right here and have my laptop as well. So it is a very important centerpiece for me to have a good computer. And the MacBook Pro lineup, the 15 or 16 inch versions are those computers. Now with that, now it's finally time to actually talk about the camera equipment and starting with the kind of like the first setup that I was using and that is this set right here. So we have a Canon EOS R right there and I still really enjoy this camera. It is a powerful camera. It has its quirks though. And of course, one of the main ones or two of the main ones are the cropped in factor of the 4K, which basically makes the 4K unusable, at least for myself. I don't really enjoy using the cropped in version of that. And of course, it also has something with the data that you actually need to shoot all 4K material. But then we also have the second aspect that I don't really appreciate about Canon at the moment, and that is the 30 minute record time limit, which has been something that other manufacturers are no longer including, but Canon is still sticking with it and not really alleviating this issue. And I hope then like crossing my fingers that they will actually finally get rid of the 30 minute record time limit once they are going to make a upgraded or updated version of the Canon EOS R. Because again, I really like the form factor. I like the colors. I like all the menus and like all of those things. I enjoy using Canon cameras. Otherwise I would not have switched back from using a Sony camera for two or three years back to Canon now. And yeah, I just hope they make this possible again so that we can actually continue using these for video properly. I also have a piece of equipment in this lineup that I actually purchased simply because of that 30 minute record time limit. Now, when I started out with the EOS R, I purchased it with the kit lens, which was the 24 to 105 f4 lens, which is again a $1,000 lens, I think. And at the time I also upgraded my microphone, not to the Rode VideoMic NTG, which you see here on the screen, but I was using the DDV Mic D3 Pro at the time. However, that is absolutely not something that I can recommend anymore. I absolutely have to say that that was not really a good investment comparing it to the VideoMic NTG, specifically for the feature set like the standby mode, the USB rechargeable mode that you actually can use USB-C cords and not just USB-A to USB-C cords and all those things. The VideoMic NTG is 100% the better microphone and I'm really glad that I then later switched from the DDV Mic D3 Pro to the VideoMic NTG from Rode. And then lastly, of course, we also have a tripod and that is the Serio something, the T200 or T25T or something like that. This is a carbon fiber tripod that I am still using as of this day. And I actually have been using for, I think around seven or eight years at this point. So that also was part of my kit all the way back to the beginning basically. So that was the starting out kit, basically. The camera with a lens, a tripod, and a shotgun microphone to mount onto the camera. This type of set is also the recommendation that I would make, not necessarily with this camera or lens combination. There are a whole plethora of different ideas and reasonings behind not going with this way or going this way, but this type of set in terms of camera, lens, microphone, and tripod. Because with that, you actually can vlog, you can do landscape shooting, you can do any kind of talking head videos type stuff. You have a whole lot of options with this setup. And thus, that was my starting point. For me, the next investment was actually around audio and that brought me into the area of podcasting as well. There I invested in the Zoom H5 and two of the Shure Beta 57A microphones, which I also have one of those right here. Now, I really like this microphone because of the fact that it is a little smaller in terms of the head than its other companion microphone, the Shure Beta 58A, and this is the 57A. This, however, is also not necessarily a microphone that is very deep in terms of the frequency set. And there are definitely other microphones that might be more interesting specifically if you are shooting for that radio announcer voice. 
Now these microphones are still great. However, I would not necessarily put those out as the first choice for podcasting. They are not the cheapest. They're also not necessarily the deepest sounding and you might want to get more of that Shure SM7B sound but with a cheaper microphone. And there are options for that, like the Rode PodMic, for example. But this was the set that I chose to go with at that time. The Zoom H5 is a great audio recorder, despite being a relatively old recorder, and the Shure Beta 57A microphones. Now from here, my next upgrade was actually a lens, and that was the 35mm RF 1.8 macro capable lens that I am also speaking into as of right now. So this field of view that you are seeing right here is actually the 35 millimeter f1.8 on the Canon EOS R in full HD so it's not cropped in at all. I really like the depth of field that I get with this and also overall the workings in terms of the autofocus and also I think it has stabilization as well. So all of those things are really nice. A couple of the benefits of this lens are that it is one, one of the cheapest RF lenses that you can buy. It is also capable of doing somewhat of a macro work. So it is a multi-purpose lens in that way. And the 35 millimeter focal length is actually really nice for photography as well as video work. Of course, it would be great to have a 1.4 or 1.2 in that area to do even more depth of field work. However, I think it's a great, small, relatively lightweight and inexpensive lens and I can totally recommend that one. Now jumping back into the products, we have another upgrade which happened around the same time and that was the Aperture MC lights. These are multicolored RGB lights and they are great for prop lights and also for background lighting. I really enjoy playing around with the colors on these despite not necessarily using them every single time. I had a time where I was heavily using these for lighting the background in a blue and orange kind of look. Nowadays I am moving away from using this type of extreme lighting and I am more and more working toward a natural light feel and so these lights are actually being less used now than they have been in the beginning when I purchased them. But they are powerful lights, they are battery powered, you can power them via USB-C, you can control them with your smartphone and I still enjoy using these two every now and then. Now from these lights we have another major upgrade and that actually was the Atomos Ninja V. This is a monitor as well as a recorder and it actually can record ProRes in RAW if your camera supports it and also in ProRes LT, ProRes HQ and standard ProRes. It also supports DNxHR, has histogram features and way more than that. And this is actually also the monitor that I am using right now here in the front of the frame. That is what I am using to record these video sessions right here. Now this recorder is really powerful because it gives you a ProRes file to work with and it also alleviates the problem of the 30 minute record time limit that the Canon EOS R has internally because now you are using the HDMI out and sending that signal to the ProRes recorder and then you have a SSD attached to the recorder and that is then used as the storage medium which is relatively inexpensive compared to SD cards or CFast cards and also can be used on the computer directly without having to transfer those files off in any kind of way. Now I really enjoyed this upgrade at the time heavily because it alleviated the problem of the 30 minute record time limit and it gave me better performance in terms of the editing on my computer because ProRes files are way easier to edit on a Mac than for example the H.264 files that you get from the camera. However, one of the things that I have to mention here is that I would probably not have made this investment if I would have known that I would have had other options later on. And I will talk more about that toward the end because there we have a piece of equipment where I would probably make a different choice and that also comes back to the recorder being not part of that type of set. However, it is still a great recorder. It is a powerful monitor and recorder and it can be used on top of the camera or like I am using it right here, mount it somewhere on your set so that you can monitor yourself, see what is going on and of course have that recording in ProRes RAW or ProRes quality. And if you are using a camera which supports ProRes RAW via HDMI, then this recorder actually might also be able to record that. I think there's a couple of Nikon cameras as well as the Sony A1 and the A7S III. 
those can output a raw signal to the recorder and then you have way more options in the post-processing, but you also might not actually want to do that. For example, I would not want to shoot these types of videos in ProRes RAW because of the storage needs. Those would be just insane and it does not really make much sense. However, if you are doing, for example, documentary or even feature film work, then that of course is a great option to have available. The next upgrade was around sound again, this time exchanging the H5 to be the F6 and actually using the Octava MK012. Those two are again still in use today. The Zoom H5 I'm actually in the process of selling. However, the Zoom F6 is the recorder that I am using here in the studio for the recording of the sound of these videos and the Octava is actually the microphone that is mounted out of frame right here. Now you might hear that there's actually a whole bunch of echo going on in this studio and that is because the room is not really treated all that well. I have my little curtain which I am speaking into, however I still have a very open space behind me and of course also the ceiling which has a whole bunch of bouncing sounds which I would love to get, take care of, however it's just such a massive investment to actually be able to change this room to sound better that at the moment that's just not a possibility for me. So we have to work with what we got. Now this upgrade, however, was one that is inspired by the fact that the Zoom F6 actually supports 32-bit float audio recording and the Octava is a great voice microphone on this short distance inside of rooms like this. I have tested it against all kinds of different mics and if you wanna check out those videos, I have a playlist down below where I am talking about all kinds of different pencil type microphones and also comparing all of those to the Rode VideoMic NTG as well as for example a Lavier type microphone in this type of room that I am using here. So this was a upgrade that was all about sound and of course I am also still using the microphones that you can see above here, the Shure Beta 57A, which are used for podcast recording. And now I'm just using the Zoom F6 as the recorder because that features the 32-bit float audio recording, which means that I don't really have to worry about the gain setting whilst I am doing the recording. And instead I can just simply focus on the podcast and actually having the conversation flowing and then in the aftermath, I can just send that through to I, uh, Isotopes RX-8 for loudness normalization and all of those other processing things that I want to be doing on those tracks. So that was a massive upgrade and I absolutely loved the audio recorder. However, again, this is also one of those things where I think I probably could have saved those 1000 euros, which is the recorder plus the microphone, and just went ahead with a video mic NTG, which I'm still using when I do on-camera work, for example, I put the mic on there and then do a vlog type video or something like that. But you can also use something like the video mic NTG on a boom arm like here, the arm that I have set up there, and then the microphone just out of frame like so, I could also just use a video mic NTG right there and be fine with a extension cord, a TRS extension cord. And that of course would then be plugged directly into the camera and that actually would alleviate another problem that I always have now and that is the synchronization of audio and video. Now of course a audio recorder like the Zoom F6 will get you way better quality than recording internally. However, you have to kind of think about whether or not that's actually a worthy investment. Because the recorder costs around 700 euros or so and now the question becomes, is that actually worth a investment for you to have the capabilities of 32-bit float recording and also the preamps that are better in these types of recorders or would you rather continue making videos with the set that you already have, with the mic that you might already have, and just continue working with that, not worrying about the synchronization of audio and video, not worrying about having spent a whole bunch of money on something that is just a marginal investment or a marginal improvement. Now you could always argue that marginal improvements like that, especially on sound, are also important to have viewers watch your videos longer, but it might be a consideration that you should be doing. And I personally would say, I probably could still do my videos with the video mic NTG just mounted out of frame and route it directly into the camera or into the ATM, which we'll talk about in a minute. 
all that would be a totally valid option and a totally valid setup and it would also give you great results. This is actually one of those things where I feel a little bit insecure about my gear choices because I got carried away purchasing something that is of course very valuable and has a great feature set. However, I could just make these videos without the Zoom F6 and I also could do them without the Octava MK012 and I just wanna have you know that it might just be better to think about this three times, do more videos, save more money, have a little bit longer in terms of your buffer if you are wanting to do YouTube full-time, for example, and not worry about those big investments at the beginning and just keep on making those videos the way that you do. And bringing the microphone closer to yourself is actually probably one of those best things that you can do to improve the sound quality. So a boom arm of some sorts or something like that and a TRS extension cord may be just everything that you need to improve on your video productions. Now from this point, we bring it back and this time around, it actually was a investment that I did not plan on making at all. And that was a second Canon EOS R. Now I right now use two Canon EOS R, but at the moment when I was doing that investment, I actually did not make this investment because I wanted to, but because my first Canon EOS R kind of broke down because of some dummy battery stuff that I was trying around and playing around with. There are videos on the channel if you wanna look those up. One of the most important aspects of that video is if you are using dummy batteries, make sure you use them in the setup that they are intended to be used and if you want to make sure if it's the right one, then get a multimeter and test the batteries if they are outputting the same voltage that the batteries actually should be outputting. So that is one of the things that I did wrong. I fried my camera and had to send it in for repairs, but I did not know whether or not it would actually be able to be repaired, especially after the first repair shop actually telling me that they are not able to do the repair on this camera. So at that point, I then purchased a second Canon EOS R because I wanted to have a working camera that I can use for the video productions here because this is becoming my full-time job and I am working on that. Now, luckily, I sent it to Canon second and then they were actually able to fix the first Canon EOS R and now I have two, which is actually really good because that means that I can do work like this and have the Canon EOS R right there and also have one that I have in the studio teleprompter right in front of me. And that way I can work with multiple angles at the same time. And I have always been a person that really loves that process because it gives me the freedom of actually producing faster instead of having to shoot something first and then shoot it from a different angle again and redo shoots and stuff like that. I never really liked that process. And so I'm actually really happy to have two of these cameras available. And of course, because I already had the RF 35 and the 24 to 105, those are actually also the lenses that I am now using. I have the 35 millimeter right in front of me. So that's filming me as in this video right there. And then I have the 24 to 105 right there. Depending on the use case, it's at 50 millimeters. Sometimes it's at 24 millimeters just depends on what I am doing at any given moment. Now that camera upgrade out of the way, we are going to the next one and that is actually the teleprompter. Now this is again something that you see right there on the screen. In this case, we are talking about the Leventi teleprompter and I have made a video about that recently so I'm gonna link that in the description below and I am using it with the Feel World T7 monitor and that's actually a really cool and really cheap monitor. It is right here in the teleprompter and that monitor is 4K capable but it only passes through 4K so don't be fooled by that. It displays a 1080p signal and it also has histograms, focus peaking and similar features. The most important feature for me, however, was that this monitor actually features the ability to mirror and flip the image. This is specifically important when you are using it as a teleprompter because there it might be not possible to read the text if you are not mirroring it in some way. 
Now teleprompter applications that you might want to use on your iPad or iPhone, if you want to put that in there, those already support the mirroring of text and stuff like that so that you can use it with a teleprompter. However, I use this here as a screen for monitoring myself and also as a screen for my computer. So I can put the screen of the computer onto the teleprompter. And that means that I actually see everything correctly if the monitor can actually mirror everything. So the mouse moves correctly the keyboard shows correctly or the keyboard strokes that I make, the typing shows correctly. All of those things are correctly displayed in the teleprompter despite the teleprompter actually mirroring the image. So that was one of the very important choices that I made there. I also have a video comparing this monitor to another one and of course the video about the teleprompter setup in total. Now I really love having the teleprompter here because it means that I can look straight in the camera and I can see what is going on in terms of the filming process and what I am currently showing. This is also even more interesting with the upcoming change that I then made with a actual live switcher because this way I can see what I am live switching. I can see when I'm using the camera behind me and I show something on the table, I am actually still looking straight into the camera because I can see what the camera behind me sees. So that is actually an incredible upgrade right there. Of course, you can also use a teleprompter to read scripts, for example. However, I have not really made that much experience with that because most of my videos aren't scripted to the T. I'm mostly just using bullet point lists and I much prefer knowing what I am filming as I am looking into the teleprompter. Now, before having a teleprompter, I was using the flip out screen of the Canon EOS R and that actually was one of the main reasons why I purchased the Canon EOS R to begin with because it had that flip out screen which the A7S and the A7 II, both of the twos, did not have at the time. Now, the Sony cameras do have the flip out screens as well, but at the time, the Canon EOS R actually was one of the first to feature that in a mirrorless body again. So that was one of the aspects there. And I also, of course, use the Atomos Ninja V because that, of course, also shows the image again so I can actually see that. However, if I look at the monitor right there, it is way lower at the moment at least than the image if I am looking into the teleprompter. I'm actually looking probably straight into the camera and that works way better. And that actually brings me to the last upgrade and the current state. And that was the ATM Mini switcher and the MIDI controller, the Behringer X-Touch Mini. Those are actually really incredible devices, in my opinion. I recently made a video about that switch and also what that means in terms of what it makes possible for me. But what I essentially have here is the ATM Mini from Blackmagic Design. And this is a four port HDMI live switcher and also can be used as a webcam. So all of this here can mix audio. It has two additional microphone ports. It can do effects like the picture in picture that you see right now and also green screen as well as include some type of overlays and all that. So it is a really powerful little device for around 280 euros. And then I also have this right here, which is a MIDI controller. And this is actually the Behringer X-Touch Mini. And I have made a little bit of a program to be able to have very specific things functioning on the ATM with buttons on this one right here. For example, I can actually twist this here and change the position that I have myself in. And then I can also bring myself back. I can also scale myself so it's a little smaller or a little bigger, reset that and also move myself in this box and make sure that I'm actually center. Now I'm not necessarily using all of these features all the time, but some of the most important ones are, for example, that I can switch immediately between a full screen version of myself and a version with the picture in picture right there, but also the ability to switch those two so that now I actually have those two switched out. Those are things that are usually only possible with the uh, software controls of the ATM Mini. However, this way I have dedicated buttons for these features and that makes the usage of the ATM Mini that much more convenient. Now, if you're interested in my recent upgrade about the Blackmagic ATM Mini and why I chose this over the others, 
then you can of course check out links in the description below because there I already talked about these topics and I will continue talking about the ATM Mini and I am also going to be saving up for the ATM Mini Extreme ISO because that would probably be my preferred version of this because it has way more features and way more capabilities and that's actually kind of mind boggling what they were able to pack into that device. But as a starting point, the ATM Mini is a powerful live switcher that can change a whole lot of things. For me here, it means that now I am actually recording one stream of video into the Atomus Ninja V right there, which is actually coming out of the ATM Mini. So I am live switching what I am recording so I don't have to do the editing in the aftermath. I am still doing editing in the post-processing. However, that's mostly to take out mistakes and also stuff where I redid certain sentences and stuff like that. But this changed everything because now it means that I don't have to take out any cards from all of the different devices. I just have one video file and one audio file. I am still doing the recording of audio separately on the Zoom F6 in 32-bit float because it gives me that 32-bit float audio. I am, however, routing the line out signal as well as the timecode signal both into the ATM Mini and that gets then sent into the Atomus Ninja V with the video so that I actually have timecode to sync the video and the audio and also have a backup track of the audio recorded in the video file in case I, for example, forget to hit the record button on the Zoom F6. Now, this is the whole set. That is everything that I am currently using in terms of video and audio equipment. I also have, of course, stuff like monitors. I have stands for all kinds of different things. I have a whole bunch of cables also lying around, but I thought that we wanna focus on the big picture here. These are the pieces of equipment. Now, why have I built this type of set? Well, mostly because of productivity. Because this set, especially with the ATM Mini now, gives me the option to make videos way, way quicker than it was previously possible. If, for example, you have just one camera, then you have to do the talking head video and then the B-roll in the aftermath, or you have to do the B-roll first and then the talking head video. This way, I can do both at the same time. It's more like a live production or a, I don't know, some type of teacher in a classroom that is showing something with different angles at the same time. Kind of like a live stream situation. And I am actually planning to also do and incorporate more live stream work and also remote call stuff with this setup because it is possible and also a lot of fun. However, this set is not just something that you can use for these situations, but you can actually do video recording like this as well. And then you have way less work in the editing. Personally, I, for example, love the fact that I now can do screen recordings without actually having to tax my computer with the recording of the screen on top of everything by just simply routing the signal to the ATM and then having that be part of this recording already. I also love the fact that I have the ProRes on the Atomus Ninja V as the recording because that makes it very easy for me to edit on the computer. However, one thing that I already mentioned right at the beginning of this video, if I had to completely start from scratch, I would probably not get this exact setup. I would probably focus on the ATM Mini Extreme ISO or the ATM Mini Pro ISO for the recording and the switching and not purchase the ProRes Recorder Atomus Ninja V and instead use another cheap monitor for the purpose of just seeing what is going on or even focus on the teleprompter to begin with. Because these features are then built into the Blackmagic Design ATM Mini, depending on which version you might want to choose with, that of course would be a more expensive device. However, you would not have to purchase the Atomus Ninja V, which is another 700 euros, and you could just put that into the Blackmagic Design device, and there you actually also have ISO recordings, meaning that this device right here would actually just record every stream of the HDMI separately so that you can actually work with those individually in the aftermath and possibly even change the cuts. That is actually something that is currently not possible for me, for example, because as I bake this in, I only have this one shot that you are seeing right now with the picture in picture and myself in the background. If I switch, then I have a cut right there. There's nothing else going on. 
Now that's one of the considerations. There's another one, which is I would probably not necessarily go for the Zoom F6 and the Octava MK012 and instead just keep on using, for example, the Rode VideoMic NTG as an overhead microphone with an extension cord directly plugged into the ATM Mini Extreme or directly plugging it into the camera so that I don't worry about video synchronization with audio and also I would not have spent that money. And then we have the third and last consideration and that's around the camera choice. If I were to have to start from scratch, it all depends on the budget that I would be working with, whether or not I would choose the Canon EOS R again or not. The Sony a6400, for example, would be a great choice for a starting out YouTuber because it does not have the 30 minute record time limit. It has HDMI out if you wanna use it for a webcam situation with a capture card or with an ATM mini. And it also features 4K recording without any crop whatsoever. Of course, it is a crop sensor already, so you already have to take that into consideration. But you can get a camera with a lens for around $1,000 or euros, comparing that to the Canon EOS R at about 1,700 euros, and you still had to get a lens for that as well. So I'm not saying that this is the perfect set, but it is what I ended up with right now. As a complete overview, the Canon EOS R twice, two lenses from Canon, a couple of tripods, the Atomos Ninja V for recording videos, and also a couple of microphones. The Rode VideoMic NTG is my absolute favorite on-camera microphone, the Octava MK012 as a overhead mic, then the Zoom F6 for sound recording with 32-bit float is incredible. The ATM Mini is an amazing starting point for this type of live switching and working in that kind of way with picture in picture and also using that as a webcam signal for live streams or remote calls. And then the Behringer X-Touch is also really powerful to actually automate a whole lot of things if you have the knowledge or the programs that can work with MIDI. Then I also have the Shure Beta 57A microphones, which I use for podcasts, but not necessarily something I would totally recommend you use because I think there are more podcasty sounding microphones out there. And lastly, we have the teleprompter, which I really love to use, especially as a camera monitor to see myself and see what is actually going on right now. So I hope this was interesting or helpful for you in seeing my upgrade journey. Of course, it's not perfect, and it is a whole bunch of money that is actually used in this kind of production here, but it makes my life much easier. If you have any questions around this topic or this equipment, you can of course leave those in the comment section down below. I will try to answer you there, but you can also connect with me on my Discord server, which I will have linked in the description as well, and we can chat there in different rooms about all kinds of different topics, and it is a little bit easier to manage than the YouTube comment section. So those are places to get in touch with me, and of course, I would appreciate your thumbs up. That always helps out a lot with the YouTube algorithm. Have an amazing day. Make good choices around your equipment. I hope you don't have to sell too many things to rebuy stuff and all that. And with all that said, have an amazing day and I will see you in the next video. Ciao, ciao.